Good afternoon. I'm Jenny Yang at the Urban Institute, and I'd like to welcome you to our live virtual event today on behalf of my colleagues at the Aspen Institute Future of Work Initiative and A Better Balance. We thank you for taking the time to join us for an important discussion as we release a new report, Reimagining Workplace Protections, a policy agenda to meet independent contractors and temporary worker needs. We thank the Ford Foundation and especially Ana Wadia for support of this ongoing collaboration among our organizations. First, I'll share some housekeeping details. This event is being recorded and the recording will be posted online. So please feel free to share it out with others afterwards. The speaker bios are online and all participants are muted, but we will have time for questions. So you can type your questions or comments into the Q&A box, which is, should be at the bottom of your screen. And you can do this at any time to share questions or thoughts for the panel. And we encourage participants to tweet using the hashtag live at urban. So now I'll share a brief overview of the objectives and findings of our report, and then I'll turn it to Shelley Stewart of the Aspen Institute, who will moderate a panel with a phenomenal group of worker advocates to share opportunities on the ground to advance workplace equity and build worker power. We will close with some reflections and next steps from Molly Weston Williamson of A Better Balance. Our report provides a roadmap for policymakers and worker advocates as they consider strategies to strengthen protections for independent contractors and temporary workers. In addition, we also have two fact sheets, one addressing the needs of independent contractors and a second focusing on temp workers. We started this report because as globalization, technology and shifts in corporate governance have led businesses to prioritize short-term profits and many companies have replaced traditional employment relationships with non-standard work arrangements, including reliance on independent contracting and temporary staffing agencies. More than 15 million people in the US work in non-standard arrangements. People of color, women, immigrants, and people with disabilities are overrepresented in these often low paying jobs, reflecting how inequities have shaped the labor market throughout US history. As work becomes more precarious for more workers, we examine solutions to address long-standing gaps in workplace protections through policy tied to meaningful enforcement systems that address the power imbalances between vulnerable workers and the companies that benefit from their labor. Each proposal we identify is rooted in the goal of empowering workers and building an equitable and resilient labor force for the future. We focus especially on the equity impacts of non-standard work arrangements for communities of color, women, and people with disabilities, examining both how these workplace structures enable discrimination and also how business models shift the risks of harm disproportionately to these workers. Although the weaknesses in our system of workplace protections have developed over decades, the COVID-19 crisis has exacerbated problems for our most vulnerable workers and added urgency to the need for solutions. Although the pandemic social and economic harms have been widespread, people of color, women, and individuals with disabilities have faced some of the most devastating effects from health impacts, unemployment rates, and caregiving obstacles. Two convenings of worker advocates from around the country that we held over the course of this year inspired these proposals. These worker roundtables included leaders of organizations working with temp workers, farm workers, domestic workers, creative professionals, and others. We thank all those who took the time to participate in these roundtables. New workplace technologies, including platforms like Uber and Instacart, have also intensified the need for stronger workplace protections for those classified as independent contractors. Whether they lack other options or because they prefer to work independently, these independent contractors are often left without the work-related safety net supports and protections they need. Today, we'll also explore the impact of AB5, a California law that aims to crack down on misclassification of employees as independent contractors and to Proposition 22, the California ballot measure that passed in November that exempts app-based delivery and drivers from AB5. 
allowing these gig companies to continue classifying their workers as independent contractors while providing some limited benefits and protections to these workers. Our report examines the interrelationship of policies such as AB5 and the incentives it can create for businesses to shift to subcontracted work, such as temp staffing, to avoid the responsibilities of an employer. Temp staffing is one form of contracted work or subcontracted work that has seen growth after the end of the Great Recession in 2009, with temp agency jobs growing over four times faster than jobs overall. Temp staffing agencies are also increasingly providing workers for long-term arrangements, straying from their original purpose of short-term jobs. As temporary work has grown, job quality has deteriorated with Black and Latinx workers disproportionately represented in these jobs. Temp workers earn 20 to 25% less an hour than those in permanent direct hire positions while facing higher injury rates. In addition, many temp agencies engage in discriminatory hiring practice, steering black workers in particular to the least desirable, hazardous and unstable jobs. Today, we will explore how US policy infrastructure must evolve to offer a higher universal baseline for all workers that requires companies to contribute their fair share to workers rather than exploiting, exploiting loopholes in laws to avoid responsibilities to workers. Our goal is to advance integrated and inclusive workplace protections that facilitate the use of non-standard work relationships for limited purposes to meet specific needs for short-term assignments or specialized independent contractor skills, rather than as a business strategy to avoid responsibility and cut labor costs. And now I'm delighted to turn over the program to Shelley Stewart of the Aspen Institute to introduce our panelists. Thank you so much, Jenny. And thanks to all of you for tuning in to this important conversation. Uh, so we're thrilled to be joined by four folks who are really at the forefront of fighting for strengthened worker protections. Uh, so first we have Vanessa Bain, the co-founder of the Gig Workers Collective. Uh, and if you could each turn on your cameras as I introduce you. Uh, Dave Desario, of the director of Temp Worker Justice. Uh, Rafael Espinal, Executive Director of the Freelancers Union, and Jerry Boo Hill, Executive Director of the Mississippi Workers Center for Human Rights. Thanks for having us, Shelley. Yes, thank you all so much for, for being here and, and sharing some of your in, insights with our audience. Uh, so if we could have Raphael and Jerry. Me, Shelley, yes. um, I'm getting a message saying I can't start my video because the host has stopped it. So every time I click on the start video, it doesn't come on. Okay, well, hopefully the urban tech folks can help you out with that. In the meantime, uh, we can hear you great. So uh, apologies for that. It's working now, sorry. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Wonderful now to see you all as well. Um, by way of introduction, I'd like to ask you each to tell us a bit about the workers who you work with. Uh, and we'd be interested in hearing especially about some of the biggest challenges that these workers face uh, and, and how they're left out of our current system of, of workplace protections. So uh, Vanessa, if we could start with you. Sure. Uh, so my name is Vanessa Bain. I'm the co-founder of an organization called Gig Workers Collective. Um, as the name suggests, <laughs> we are a collective of gig workers um, and primarily focus on folks that are um, doing grocery shopping and delivery as well as other delivery based work. Um, I think that most folks are familiar with the gig economy when it comes to rideshare. Uh, but, you know, there's this whole ecosystem that's that's broader than just rideshare um, and that has, I think, due to the pandemic, uh, really been highlighted in terms of the essential, uh, you know, component of, of our labor. Um, so I work alongside folks that are the most diverse and talented group of people I have ever met in my life. Um, and I have a background in education and I, I met some great people there, but gig workers really... Um, you know, folks that are oftentimes marginalized um, or economically disenfranchised folks, um, 
people end up in this work for a variety of reasons, including discrimination in, in hiring in the traditional economy, including um, language barriers, including, you know, immigration status, um, and sort of racial injustice that they may have faced otherwise um, in, in, in traditional employment. And, and so, you know, the gig economy for all of its faults does have one really great strength and that is there is a pretty low barrier to entry, right? Um, and so we end up with, again, a, a just a very um, diverse and broad group of, of folks that bring really rich life experience um, and, and really have priorities that are varied all over the place, right? Um, that brought them to doing this work. Uh, so I think that, you know, we're, we're working with sort of this intersectional framework of people who are struggling with housing um, issues, with racial justice issues, with um, immigration issues. And so our organizing necessarily has to be um, intersectional and, and really work for the most marginalized people um, in the gig economy, because what benefits them will benefit everybody, but not vice versa. Great. Thank you so much. You brought up several themes that I think will continue to thread through this, this conversation. Uh, Dave, I'll turn it over to you. Sure. Uh, like Vanessa's organization, ours is very aptly named. Uh, I'm the director of Temp Worker Justice. We focus on temporary workers. And, and Jenny gave a good overview of who temp workers are in her introduction. I thought it might make some sense to talk about who temp workers aren't, because there are a lot of misperceptions, starting with the name temp, implying that they're temporary. And really, it's, you know, temporary workers are increasingly used as a long term and permanent solution to replace what used to be good, permanent, stable jobs, often union jobs, but are now uh, subcontracted or insourced, you know, the, in the same location version of being outsourced, uh, you know, on a daily basis. It's somewhere between four and a half million and six million workers in the US workforce. Um, as Jenny mentioned, less pay about twice the injury rates as the permanent direct hire workers that they're working uh, side by side with. And you know, just to clear up a little confusion about temp, we try to think of it as an acronym, not as the descriptive word. It, it has nothing to do with the length of time because someone can work a temporary job for years or work a series of temp jobs for you know, a significant portion of a career. So temp is really, it's a t.e.m.p. It's a third party employee with minimal pay. It's just another strategy to pay less and distance employers' responsibility uh, that they have to the workers that work for them. And you know, the big picture, the issues that it causes, you know, like other forms of contingent work, gig work, independent contractors, the freelancers that are here, uh, temp staffing is there to blur the lines of responsibility and accountability. So temp workers are more likely to experience some kind of injustice in the workplace, discrimination, harassment, uh, wage theft, and they're less likely to be able to exercise their rights and to be able to do something about it. Thank you, Dave. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Rafael. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. I'm Rafael Espinal. I am the head of the Freelancers Union. And just like every other organization, uh, our, our, our purpose and mission is in our name and that's to uh, work in, and support and fight for the rights and advocate for uh, the freelance workforce. Uh, we uh, look at issues that affect all independent workers. Uh, so our organization is open to anyone uh, who works in receipt of 1099, uh, who's looking to uh, uh, be part of a community uh, that understands the issues that independent workers are facing. Uh, and then we, we also advocate uh, on um, specifically on laws that affect the financials and any legal uh, uh, situation that freelancers as a whole might might uh, might uh, deal with. For example, in New York City, we were very successful in passing uh, a law called the Freelancers and Free Act to help uh, uh, freelancers, independent workers, uh, collect unpaid wages from clients with the help of the City of New York. Uh, we also work to pass uh, a, a workplace uh, or, or extend workplace uh, discrimination and harassment uh, protections uh, to independent contractors. Something that wasn't available. To independent workers in the past as well. Uh, right now, we're hoping to see the same level of protections happen in other cities and hopefully on a federal level so that all workers uh, could get the same protections. Uh, we as an organization currently represent or have about 500,000 members. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I would say that those members mostly, uh, while we do represent all, all independent workers, they mo they're mostly in creative fields. Uh, so a lot of our members are working in the film industry, in the music industry, our designers, graphic designers, and a lot of writers as well. Uh, and uh, I would say that there, there, there are a lot of inequities that exist in those fields, uh, specific, specifically for, for immigrants and people of color. Uh, I would say the, the, the opportunities uh, are, aren't evenly distributed. Uh, they, they, uh, the inequities also exist in, in the workplace uh, uh, conditions as well. Uh, so when uh, we, as, as we did in New York with the, with the harassment and discrimination bills, you know, we also look to uh, try to find ways to elite, uh, even out the playing field uh, as well across the board. Uh, so that's who we are and, and that's our work and happy to be here. So much. And Jerry Boo. Thank you and good afternoon to everyone. We're with the Mississippi Workers Center for Human Rights. We were founded coming up on our 24th year. We were founded December 30th, 1996 to address issues concerning low wage, mostly black and brown working poor individuals who've been classified as uh, everything from the working poor to absolutely the most exploited. Uh, we are a part of a partnership with the National Employment Law Project and the Temporary Worker Justice Project with uh, Dave and several others to continue advocating for the rights of temporary workers and other marginalized uh, workers who literally have no protections. Some of the things that we've spotted in the work that we've been doing for the past 24 years, when we first started our organization, we were visited by workers from Morris Foods, which then was better known as Uncle Ben's Rice Company. And we talked to workers who had worked for 15 years or more and still been classified as temporary workers. And needless to say, all my years of experience in workers' rights and social justice and human rights causes, I was unfamiliar with this so-called, what I've heard NELP folks say is permatemp type work. I was not familiar with people going beyond uh, someone being on maternity leave and then uh, you replace them until they come back from maternity leave. I've never had heard of workers working for this length of time. So we do have that system firmly in place and it is used overall to create another type of workforce. It is a union busting tactic. We even have union uh, plants and uh, workplaces who also use uh, temporary workers. And so we wanna see the pressure brought to bear on these companies. We have been engaged in conversations with Mars and of course they lie a lot. That's all I can say. They, oh, we're down to 20% temporary, we're gonna change our policies, yet we still hear from workers who say that those policies have not changed and that they can still work anywhere from a year to 20 years being temporary workers. And we're seeing that uh, the climate of fear, uh, the fear of unemployment, especially during the pandemic, the fear of retaliation in other forms such as diminishing work hours, false layoffs, in, in, in other words, you're not coming back, but they say it's a layoff. And basically looking at the conditions as well that temporary workers work under. Very, very unsafe conditions, lack of training, injuries and deaths because they are considered to be disposable and uh, basically not present in the permanent so-called workforce. So we are supporting policies and uh, legislation, including the federal temporary worker bill and other legislation at the state, local and federal levels to try to address these issues. And we want to see more in terms of demands lifted up for temporary workers, including the living wage, including paid sick leave, paid time off, full benefits, full employment after a very short time, as opposed to the lengthy uh, assignments that people experience at this time. And I look forward to the conversation going forward. Thank you so much. Thank you all for sharing. Uh, there's definitely some, some shared challenges that you all touched on, as well as some, some unique situations that you, you each have 
uh, insight into. Uh, so something that several of you brought up um, that I'd like to dive a bit deeper into uh, is the extent to which expanding workplace protections to these workers, especially temporary workers, misclassified workers, and independent contractors uh, is a matter of racial equity. Uh, and, and if you could share a bit based on your experiences, how the current system of workplace protections uh, contributes to racial injustice. I can speak to that and thank you for the question. Uh, what we've noticed is that most jobs are uh, assigned by race. Uh, we deal with the Jim Crow employment system here in the Mississippi Delta where 43% of our population resides in abject poverty and most people are in low wage jobs. And most of those people who are in those low wage jobs are non-white, mostly black and brown people. And what we're seeing is that the assignments are given based on race as well. So you can work in a factory, but you're gonna be on the line. You're never gonna be in the office typing or filing or making calls or meeting the public. You're gonna be locked down on the assembly line and everybody on that line from the catfish plants to the poultry plants are gonna be black people and brown people. So racial segregation in the workplace is still alive and well and it is used as a way of assigning and uh, maintaining the uh, divided workforce and keeping workers divided. So yes, we are seeing assignments based on race. Most of the temporary workers that we have spoken to, the 40 plus that we've interviewed through the project that we're working on with Dave and others, all of them are African-American workers and none of them have been offered full-time employment. So yes, it is definitely deeply resided in uh, the zone of racism and racial, uh, racial, the lack of preference for some races in terms of non-white people being assigned the most gruesome and dirtiest and most undesirable jobs. And, and that exactly checks out with some of the work that was done uh, with some partner organizations in Chicago doing some match pair testing style investigations at temporary staffing agencies where uh, workers were divided by race and gender. One was sent into a temp agency and then 15 minutes later another, both with equal qualifications. And the results found it was close to two thirds of those situations produced a different job offer or response very cl clearly by race and gender. So it's not a problem of, uh, you know, that's happening in Mississippi or one other location. It's not a problem for men or women, uh, black workers or Latinx workers. It's really across the board that this system is really used to discriminate uh, against workers of all types and to divide them, divide workforces and divide them into substandard jobs and working conditions. I think and in the- yes, uh, Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, please, go ahead. please finish, go ahead. Now, I was just going to cite yet another example of the largest employer in our state is Northrop Grumman Shipbuilding. And within Northrop Grumman, they also use uh, temporary workers. And so does the Nissan, Nissan system, the only non-union part of the Nissan Organization International is based in the United States. They are the only non-union uh, Nissan company. They use Kelly workers. And, and at the time when they had their union election, the union election to bring the union in, the Kelly workers were not allowed to vote. And so that election was lost. 2,300 people voted against the union and 1,300 voted for it. The bosses had been threatening to take back leased, leased cars and uh, cut hours and lay people off if they sided with the union. So it, it is true. These larger companies are definitely uh, right there in terms of being culpable. I think also um, just speaking to the experience that that I've seen and witnessed and, and been through in the gig economy, um, I can say with confidence that like none of the challenges that we face as gig workers um, would be challenges that a predominantly white workforce faced. Um, the way that we have been misclassified, the ramifications of that misclassification, including things like, um, you know, with the passage of Prop 22, I was stripped of my labor rights um, and I was stripped of my, uh, you know, 
eligibility for really vital programs, especially during a pandemic, things like unemployment insurance, things like um, my right to have employer sponsored health care, um, paid sick leave, all of these kinds of things. Um, and the reality is, is that 78% of gig workers are people of color, right? Um, they're black and brown folks, they're immigrants, over 56% of them are immigrants. Um, in the case of Instacart, the company that I work for, it's overwhelmingly women as well. It's about almost 80% of our work for force is women. So these are people that, again, have been marginalized in the traditional economy and oftentimes are using um, the gig economy as a means to an end, as a way of trying to pay their bills and feed their families. And they're working in the capacity in a capacity that is absolutely no different than any traditional W-2 employment um, and any permanent employment, um, but they're doing it on a contingency basis and they're doing it in occupations that actually have incredibly high risk of death and injury. Um, and it sounds similar to the experiences that a lot of the folks on this panel have, have recounted um, in terms of, you know, we're looking at what work is being um, gigified, right? Or what work is being um, placed in the hands of temp agencies. And it's often work um, that that should be a union job <laughs> that should come with all of the rights and protections of properly classified employment. But because we are going up against really powerful um, titans in tech right now, um, you know, there's, there's an asymmetrical power dynamic. And unfortunately, because of exactly who the workforce is, um, the abuse is, uh, you know, sort of, it's sort of dismissed um, in, a, in a way that I know with certainty would not happen if we were a predominantly white workforce. Thank you. And we're going to move into talking a bit about the questions of classification. Uh, but Rafael, I wanted to see if you wanted to weigh on on this question first. No, they, they, everyone brought up such great points. Uh, and I think, you know, on, on top of all of this, it, it goes back to the social safety net that, that continue to exist. Uh, and there should be a broader conversation of, of how governments are, are going to play a vital role in ensuring that all workers uh, have the, the basic human rights that we need to, 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 to live a life in dignity. Thank you. Um, so as a, a few of the panelists have, have mentioned so far, uh, workplace protections are closely associated with worker classification, uh, whether a worker is classified as an employee or as an independent contractor. Uh, and so I'll, I'll open it up to the group with the question of uh, how can we address this misclassification, um, considering as the, the report does that we have uh, temporary workers who are, are typically hired as employees we have misclassified workers uh, who are classified as independent contractors, but uh, the hiring entities exert a, a pretty high level of control still. Um, and we also have independent contractors who do work independently with high levels of uh, autonomy and control over their work, but still face some, some very real challenges. Um, so with that as sort of some, some background, uh, I'd open it up to, to our panelists to think about uh, what, what can we do to address rampant misclassification. I think we're seeing, uh, and I don't know about others, but I'm seeing for the first time real attention being paid to the issue of misclassification. Uh, in some ways, em employees enter the workforce and they're told that they're contract workers, uh, but they receive a W-2. And if you receive a W-2, taxes are taken and you are not you are absolutely not a contract worker, you are an employee. And the only time we find out about these contradictions and uh, false uh, classifications is when we're in litigation and they say, oh, you can't sue because she's not an employee. And then through discovery, we receive her W-2 forms. So it, it's intentional misclassification and it's lifted up now within the work that we're doing to try to send a message to the Biden-Harris administration uh, during the period where they are you know, certainly rolling out their agenda and uh, looking to various experts in the field and uh, some, some they're, they're having to be grabbed, kicking and screaming to recognize the real experts are those who suffer. And uh, those are the ones whose stories are often pimped and uh, taken to the high places, but they don't ever get there themselves. So I think misclassification has to be elevated uh, as a an anti-worker, uh, you know, 
type of uh, injustice, but also looking at regs that are in place, how those are violated uh, through the misclassification, intentional misclassification that employers engage in. And uh, we are calling for, and we've been calling for a dismantling of the temp of the total temp system and returning it to its original purpose and using it for that and nothing more. So I think the more we make demands on these systems and expose how they're being abused, I think that'll help us to really address misclassification because it's very real and people do feel that they can't raise it because they're fearful that they were gonna that they're gonna lose their jobs. However pathetic those jobs might be, folks can't afford to be jobless. So Thank you. And, and one of the things that has really elevated the, the classification conversation and put it in the, the national spotlight is what's been happening with California, first with the passage of AB5 and then the recent Proposition 22. Uh, so I'm hoping, Vanessa, that you can speak a bit about how a law like AB5 may be able to help workers um, and what the, the recently passed Prop 22, uh, what it means for, for gig workers especially. Yeah, I would be happy to. Um, so AB5 was a law that codified a Supreme Court decision in the state of California, um, which is commonly referred to as Dynamex. Um, what it did is it created a very strict and um, clear delineation, uh, a, a classification test called the ABC test um, that delineates between who is an employee and who is an independent contractor. Um, and, you know, in, in the context of the gig economy, um, it's very clear that all of these companies categorically fail every prong of that test in their current form. Um, and more importantly, um, even with adjustments and um, you know a vast overhaul of how their um, systems operate and how they boss employees with, with algorithmic management and things like that, um, the reality is, is that none of them can escape prong three prong B, which is that our labor is absolutely central to the companies that we work for, right? Um, and, it, you know, I'm a grocery uh, shopper and delivery person, and I work for a grocery shopping and delivery company. Um, I have friends that are, uh, you know, professional drivers that work for ride sharing companies, right? Um, I have friends that are professional couriers that work for companies like DoorDash. Um, all of our labor is absolutely central to the core purpose and existence of this business. Um, and so, you know, I think that that ABC test is really a much better classification test um, in large part because the previously existing classification tests or classification tests that exist maybe at the federal level or in other states um, leave a broader um, ability to be interpreted, right? Uh, and I think that it is very clear that in the case, especially of gig workers, but in the case of many misclassified workers um, or really all misclassified workers, if they are actually misclassified, um, that there is an asymmetrical power dynamic between the hiring entity and the hired labor, right? Um, one in which, you know, um, in, in true independent contracting, uh, I should be the authority in my workplace in how I do what I do, when I do it, and where I do it. Um, and the reality is, is that uh, in the gig economy, they've simply taken bossing and, and made it an app, right? <laughs> they, they have put um, my boss on my phone where it forever is with me, unfortunately. Um, but the reality is, um, that misclassification has a lot of really uh, profoundly negative consequences for misclassified workers. Um, some of those I mentioned before, those are things like, um, you know, uh, the right to health insurance, paid sick time, um, you know, any kind of retirement, any kind of workers' compensation. Um, and I also mentioned before that our jobs are, in fact, very dangerous as well. Um, and so a lot of this is rooted in these companies realizing that they can kind of have their cake and eat it too, right? They can algorithmically boss their workforce while also, you know, throwing their hands up and saying, well, we're not directly in involved in how they do what they do. Um, the app 
does that for them, right? But um, the reason why this is beneficial for them is because they do have a high degree of control, but they also absolve themselves of all of the costs, risk, and liabilities that are involved in the work that we do. Um, and because it's dangerous work and because our occupational risk of death and injury is higher than first responders like police and firefighters, um, it saves the company a grip of money, right? <laughs> like that's really why they do what they do is because it's financially beneficial and we have a lack of proper enforcement of classification um, at the state and the federal level. Um, and this is unfortunately always skewed um, against workers, right? As individuals, um, we have very little power in a very large tech company um, and we have very little uh, resources, right? Whereas these companies have tons of power and tons of resources um, and they threw those into Prop 22. Um, and so Proposition 22 was a ballot measure aimed at essentially carving only a handful of companies out of the existing law, which is AB5. Um, what it does is it creates a new standard and a third classification that is neither an employee nor a true independent contractor, but someone who is legally allowed to be bossed exactly like an employee without any of the rights, benefits, or protections of employment. And where this sends up a ton of red flags, I hope for everybody, is that while right now this looks like it's a gig economy issue, it is a larger issue in the context of all work, right? Because as soon as you can start paying people in peace rate, only when they're actively engaged in working, you're gonna get baristas that are paid by the latte that they craft. You're gonna get Walmart cashiers that are paid by the transaction that they ring up. Um, and all of that time in between will go without pay. And we can, you know, employers can hire people um, at a significantly cheaper rate and with far less cost risks and liabilities. Um, so I absolutely know that this is going to have a ripple effect into the rest of the economy. And I mean, I think we've seen facets of it in the expansion of permanent temp workers, right? Um, and the expansion of, um, you know, non-union work that used to be properly uh, recognized as, as union jobs. And the gig economies uh, maneuvers, these temp agency maneuvers, um, are largely rooted in union busting, right? And they're they're rooted in the idea that um, if we can strip some workers of their protections, then you know it's incremental, and we can continue to strip other workers of those protections and just hire more of these workers that that don't have the expectations of what comes along with properly classified and and, and permanent employment. Thank you. Um... And, and on the other side of kind of looking at what to do about classification, I'm hoping, Rafael, that you can speak to maybe some of the limitations of AB5, um, acknowledging there's, there's problems with misclassification, but, but maybe it's not the, the best solution that could be out there. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say first and foremost that the union stands behind, you know, all of the workers who are being misclassified and all the social injustice that happens uh, within the workplace. Uh, we truly believe that uh, a lot of these app companies, if not all, are, are really uh, creating an environment where there is a real wage race to the bottom. Uh, people are being hurt by it. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, given the broader conversation, you know, there is some friendly fire. We do have professional freelancers, professional, real independent contractors, like real independent drivers, real independent, uh, you know, designers, people who decided to, to leave the traditional workspace uh, to kind of craft their own way to, uh, you know, create an economy for themselves, provide for their families, create flexibility for themselves, uh, break away from the chains of corporations. Uh, and I, I would say that the biggest issue that we're, I'm hearing from our members uh, that feel that the, the law has its limits is that uh, the B prong of the, of the test, of the ABC test, uh, because uh, companies are only allowed to are not allowed to hire folks who, who are going to provide work that is such to the core function. It really got in the way for, for example, like freelance journalists being able to write for a media company, a freelance photographer being able to, to work for a photo, a photo shoot, and even musicians not being able to hire, uh, not be able to hire other, other bandmates to help them put on a production uh, because of those tests. And, and, and in California, the, those issues were heard 
uh, and it, it really created a space in which exemptions were made to a lot of different creative industries uh, to deal to deal with that. Uh, but th there's still some concern that the the exemption process uh, uh, is still con is, is an open-ended process. I think we're going to continue to hear from folks in different industries about how they're they're still caught in those cro in the crossfires. So, uh, you know, there's just a lot of thought within within that community itself of, of how can we move forward in making sure that the language is crafted in a way in which real professional uh, independent workers uh, can continue doing the work that they've been doing the way they have been doing while also addressing the, the horrendous conditions that a lot of these companies are creating. And, and that's also, I want to add that I do also hear from professional freelancers in which they're being offered full-time jobs. And they're at the end of the day, they end up being permanent freelancers uh, for, for a lot of companies uh, without getting to that to that point in which they're getting those benefits that traditional workers get as well. So I think there's a lot, there's a lot of gray area and our hope is to be able to find that, uh, be able to thread the needle in a way in which uh, we're doing the right thing uh, for, for those workers being exploited and also ensuring we're not disrupting these opportunities that exist for the professional independent worker. Yeah, thank you. And then to kind of round out the conversation about worker classification, uh, I'd like to think a bit about the relationships between different work arrangements. Uh, and Dave, I'm hoping you can share a little bit about potential uh, unintended consequences of a law like AB5. Well, I'll just say it's it's a good thing overall. It's not like the, the consequence I want to talk about with temp work outweighs the benefits, but it is a known negative effect of a law like AB5. So uh, in the after Dynamax and AB5, we saw the temporary staffing industry very explicitly advertising to its clients and a big corporation saying that they should hire temp workers as a way to avoid compliance with the law. And I think that recognizes the shared universe of contingent work that we're all in and that independent contractor reform really should be moved forward hand in hand with reform for temporary workers because employers that are uh, abusing independent contractors, misclassifying, uh, overusing them, they're trying to uh, reduce responsibility to the people that work for them and or cut costs. And temp agencies really offer those same services. So uh, in addition to the, the explicit advertising by temp agencies on this issue, the staffing industry as a whole saw a, a new California gold rush with Dynamex and AB5 that the temp industry was gonna profit handsomely um, by letting employer, employers off the hook with a slightly different way to take advantage of workers. Yeah, and that highlights one of the, the themes that runs throughout the, the report that coincides with this event, which is that we really need a holistic approach to addressing workplace protections that takes into account the need to address misclassification while also thinking about promoting quality work among temporary workers and subcontracted workers and addressing the needs of, of true independent contractors uh, and addressing all of these together can, can hopefully get us to a, a better place for everyone. Um, Thinking about some of the, you know, that that vision of the future that we might have and the the work, the world of work that we're working towards, uh, I'm hoping you can each share uh, an example or a story or a recent success of uh, workers who have really been leading the movement for expanded protections. Um, tell us about a, a recent gain that that you've seen. I'm happy to jump in real quick. Um, yeah. So I. You know, the one that I feel the most um, str strong, strongly about, I guess, like the, the best feeling I have about a recent workplace victory um, was back during the beginning of this pandemic, um, back in, you know, February and the beginning of March, um, it became pretty clear to us that this was going to be something that impacted um, our, our workforce, right? Uh, we we're in grocery stores all day long. Um, se several of my colleagues are doing things like you know ride share where people are in their cars, or um, doing things like food delivery where they're um, you know delivering from restaurants to people that are sheltering in place. Um, and while this labor at the beginning of the pandemic was deemed essential, um, the companies that employ us gave us absolutely no protection, right? Um, and because of the nature of panic buying and everybody trying to, um, you know, stock up their supplies of, of PPE, um, it was unavailable to us to even purchase on our own. 
so on March 30th, um, Instacart shoppers walked off our jobs and, and, and we stayed that line and, and really forced them to provide PPE for, um, at this point, hundreds of thousands um, and actually including ship shoppers who did the exact same thing um, the next week. Uh, we were able to secure PPE for our respective workforces um, of probably upwards of a million people uh, because companies have the power to leverage manufacturing in ways that individuals obviously do not. Um, you know, it's typical gig economy behavior to wash their hands of any responsibility um, to their workforce. But I think that we were able to really hijack that narrative uh, away from the companies acting like they're economic saviors of displaced workers and families sheltering in place back to being centered around what is happening with the workers that are actually providing these services that have been deemed essential but are treated like they're disposable. Um, and we were, you know, able to successfully secure PPE and, and pressure uh, both Instacart and Shipped, which had a ripple effect into the greater gig economy, um, to provide these types of um, protections to, to workers, um, which seemed like a no brainer. But unfortunately, um, in the world that, that we organize in uh, are things that you, you have to strike over. Uh, thank you for sharing and for your leadership and in, in getting some exciting things happening on the ground. Uh, other panelists, could you tell us a bit about, about a success, Jiribu? Uh, yes, I, um, well, success is a relative term where I'm located. Uh, Nina Simone wrote a song about us. I think you all probably have heard it, Mississippi GD, in case someone is ultra religious or religious, I won't say the word, I won't say what GD stands for, but we are really in the pits of hell here. So any victory is a victory that has to be lifted up. Uh, some workers did take on the issue of a lack of, lack of PPE during COVID and uh, they took their issue straight to city hall and uh, forced uh, the city to uh, put pressure on the employers to comply with basic CDC guidelines. Uh, temporary workers have been meeting through our worker circle. And for the first time we are seeing uh, workers who are willing to tell their stories, who are willing to be part of a delegation once the COVID uh, epidemic virus is lifted so we can go back to the state house and do our actions the way we do. We are, we are really identifying leaders from that field who are willing and ready to go and challenge the systems themselves through story grabbing, advocacy, public awareness. We're going to be doing a convening April 24th, which will combine the struggles of injured workers and temporary workers, because we believe a lot of times temporary workers are in such vulnerable spaces that they are injured and even killed because of work. But I did want to quickly lift up something that I just got. Uh, it, was, it was addressed to the Kosh Network. It says, media opportunity, essential workers will be times person of the year for 2020, Time Magazine. And I, I, at first I was like, thinking to myself silently cheering, but then also thinking about the ways in which during this period, our movements are being co-opted and exploited. And we have to be careful about these little uh, olive branches that are thrown out while uh, essential workers are still underpaid, still denied basic rights, and yet you can lift them up or you can walk sex sexual uh, victims of sexual harassment down the red carpet and they're still going to be raped at work. So I'm saying we have to be careful about this lifting up and make sure it has teeth, make sure it has substance. Thank you for that. Uh, we're going to, to address a few audience questions in a moment. Um, so audience members out there, uh, please do keep your questions coming in via the, the Q&A. Uh, but uh, Raphael, did you want to weigh in and share a, a recent success? Sure. Uh, I, I would say one of the recent successes that, you know, we have to thank uh, Better Balance New York for and this extending uh, paid leave to the independent workforce. Uh, now, for example, in New York, uh, you have the, as an independent worker, you're able to uh, to buy into or purchase paid leave insurance through the state of New York. Uh, and that's, you know, a social safety net that's usually uh, available to a traditional workforce. And now the independent worker can rely with uh, on that sense of security uh, in case that 
that they take care of a sick family member, uh, you know, they give birth, they actually were able to rely on some income to get them through those times. Uh, to my knowledge, speaking with uh, Mali, the organization, uh, there are five states in, in the country uh, that, that have implemented uh, that, that option. And uh, we hope to see it uh, expand across the country on, if not on a federal level, uh, but, you know, I think also looking at the COVID, COVID uh, pandemic, you know, it, it really shone a, shined a light on the need uh, for, uh, you know, all workers to have access to uh, these type of, of programs to, to give them the, the, the sense of security to get to these times. Uh, unemployment insurance is an, is, a, is an example of a program that wasn't available to independent workers. And once the pandemic hit, there was a lot of concern about how were they going to get by as these shutdowns were taking place. Uh, but because of the CARES Act, uh, they're now able to qualify for the weekly benefits that a traditional worker gets. Uh, so there have been some wins. Uh, there's a lot more work to do and uh, we're looking forward to continuing that work. Thank you. And Dave. Sure, uh, I'll be quick. I know we don't have much time and it'd be good to get some questions, but I want to shout out to uh, this group of temp workers in Massachusetts who work in seafood processing and to Jaribu's point that sometimes the bar is a little low and we really need to celebrate any success. You know, overwhelmingly temps have been not been able to access the same benefits as other workers. Uh, the, this basic stuff from the Families First Coronavirus Response Act that many of us took for granted that we were able to, to to access, temp workers have not, but there is this group of temps, Massachusetts and seafood processing and plant where there's like 200 workers and 180 of them are temp or so-called temp. Uh, those workers organized, they wrote a demand letter, got it signed by most of the workforce, took it to both the host employer and the staffing agency and demanded that they have the right to, to sick leave and to leave to care for their family members during the, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. And with the support of a legal advocacy, advocacy group there, Justice at Work, Justice at Work uh, got in touch with the attorneys for the host employer and the staffing agency to let them know that there were some teeth behind this as well. But um, great to see a success from, uh, you know, at will employees like temp workers who are often fired at any time for any reason, a mostly immigrant workforce and one that stood up, demanded its rights and, and won them. Yeah, thank you. These are all promising, promising steps forward with a lot of work still to be done. Uh, turning now to some, some questions from you all in the audience. Uh, this one coming from Catherine. Uh, are there companies that have been responsive to pressure and or partnerships to reduce their, uh, the work of gig contract or temp workers? Are there successful uh, models of companies that could be replicated? <laughs> You want to go first? Go. <laughs> There's not a lot. I mean, and I'm thinking of some isolated cases like um, one in Chicago at an industrial bakery uh, called Gold Standard, where it took union pressure and union organizing um, from Workers United, great organizer Chris Lamberti, uh, worker organizer Barry Rose, that recognized that temp workers who made up a significant portion of the workforce in a union facility were there for years on end, but the union contract said they should only be there for 90 days. And most people don't talk to temps. They don't know who's been there for a long time. They don't monitor that. But the temp workers like Barry Rose stood up for themselves. They got connected to the union um, and using that union contract were able to transition themselves from temp workers to not just permanent employees, but union members to get back wages that they were owed because they should have been converted to permanent and the union was able to get back dues. And it flipped this facility in the long run from one that was like 50% temp to one now that is only 10% temp, which gets closer to that intended function of, you know, when there's an increase in production that's unexpected, you might need to bring in a few people. Um, it's one example that a group called the Temp Worker Union Alliance Project is trying to replicate. They think there's a lot of these situations where there's temps in closed union shops who may be in violation of collecting bargaining agreements and could be brought into unions if union members and temp workers did more to come together, understand each other and talk about what's going on in those facilities. So that's one model through the Temp Worker Union Alliance project that we hope can be replicated, but the, the successes are, are few and far apart. Yeah, th thank you for that. And that speaks to another audience question that just came in uh, regarding what can be done to, to join temp, temp workers and union members together um, to be able to work towards better conditions. Uh, so I don't know if, if Dave or Jerry Bowie wanted to, to weigh in on that one. I, 
I definitely uh, can weigh in on that question. It's such a good question. But I also wanted to uh, lift up the fact that we are watching and waiting to see if Mars is going to live up to its commitment, which they did put in writing of reducing the temporary workforce there in Greenville, Mississippi, by to 20%, only 20% of the workforce apparently will be temporary, but we know that we have to watch and monitor that. And that came about because of workers raising their voices and because of the advocacy work of the Workers' Center and others putting the pressure on. Um, in, in, in terms of um, just, just looking at uh, the landscape uh, and how historically unions have uh, been there for workers who are not union, we remember times when the union workforce, union leadership would stand up for workers who were trying to organize. But that is really in a low period now. And we wanna see that lifted up again. We wanna see that fervor brought back where the unions see their vested interest in dismantling these union busting schemes. And, and so there shouldn't be places where they can go. There should be no hiding place. Uh, the FedEx workers, uh, the FedEx company, met with a rude awakening when they plopped their FedEx box out in front of the post office and the local union said, no, you can't put this here. This is not going to be sitting in front of the post office. This is a union shop. And they succeeded in removing the FedEx box because FedEx is not union and profoundly anti-union. So the more pressure that unions can put on this issue and see it as a moment of solidarity and a moment to swell the ranks because we are so woefully low, 12.5% nationwide are union in our state 5% and we're kind of one of the highest in the South, if you can imagine, because North Carolina is 2.3 and South Carolina is 1.2, but still the unions could play a role and it would be to their benefit. And I think these joint coalitions would be important during this period, roundtables between union leadership and uh, gig worker leadership, temporary worker leadership. I think it's, it's right for that to happen now. Thank you. And I think that's a, a great place to end on. I know there are a couple more questions which we'll try to incorporate into a, a post-event follow-up, uh, but I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Molly Weston-Williamson from A Better Balance uh, to offer just a few closing thoughts. Thanks, Shelley. And again, I think on behalf of A Better Balance, the Rand Student Aspen Institute, we just want to thank all of our great panelists today for a great discussion today, all of the participants in this event today, and really all of the folks who have done uh, contributed so much to this overall project. Um, I think to, to close things out, we did just want to highlight um, a couple of key themes that have come up in this discussion and I'll talk a little bit about next steps. I mean, I think three themes we've sort of seen throughout today's discussion. Um, first, I think are questions of equity, particularly racial and gender equity from racial sorting and temp assignments to the impacts of the overrepresentation of women and people of color in gig work. I think that's a theme that runs throughout our paper and has run throughout a lot of what we were hearing from workers in this space. Um, second, I think really thinking about the, the distinct moment we're in in terms of this COVID pandemic that, as uh, Raphael said, has really shined a light on a lot of existing problems, but it's also created some new ones. And at the same time, I think has created some real opportunities in terms of rethinking what are the ways that we can protect people and really highlighting the critical work that workers we're discussing today are doing. Um, and then finally, I think running throughout all of this, what we've really seen are essential questions around worker power that power dynamics between workers and employers or hiring entities are central to the results that workers get and that what we really need is to be working towards policy innovations, organizing strategies, real opportunities to build that worker power to ensure that workers can have the fair and safe and just workplaces they need. Um, I think building from that, just in terms of next steps, um, we encourage everyone to check out um, the paper that goes along with this event. I believe it was in your chat. We'll follow up by email. Um, as you'll see in the paper and the supporting materials, um, we really looked to highlight both needs and opportunities for temporary workers and independent contractors, as well as misclassified workers. To really build policies that build that worker power we need to see, including both policy initiatives at the federal, state, and local level, and outside and organizing strategies like the growth of worker co-ops. We've also identified some key additional research needs, particularly areas where we know we don't have the information we need to really assess what workers' needs are, to figure out what their experiences are, and to build the policy infrastructure we need. 
Um, we really encourage everyone to stay connected and continue the conversation we see today as really part of an ongoing collaboration, not only among our three organizations, but among everyone um, in this group. And we look forward to continuing to provide you um, with other exciting resources in this space. So again, thank you so much everyone for joining us and have a wonderful afternoon.